It's that time again. It's time for Extra Bases with Bristol and Booth. Jason Bristol, Jeremy Booth. Jeremy's a bit preoccupied right now because it's nearly International Week for the New Balance Future Stars series. Yeah, Boston is coming up, and it's exciting. We wait all year for this, and... Man, I've heard from all 30 clubs in the last couple of days. I even sent Mike Elias an email to make sure he had the information. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see this collection of guys on the field. Uh, there's some bona fide first-rounders, some top-10 type candidate picks. And, you know, for, for me, with one of these guys in particular, um, well, I, I, say, I say that and I, I think about all the rest of the other 49. So. But a couple of these guys have been here before. Mick Abel – it's going to be his third one. And, and you know, Mick Abel may be a, a name that's not yet familiar to some of the people listening to this, but uh, Mick's going to be a first-rounder. I mean, if, if everything goes well uh, in his, that, and he does what he normally does, he's got a chance to go in the first five picks. I mean, he's that good. Um, saw him as a freshman. It was easy, just easy to pick out. It was, okay, you're done. Seen you, 30, 40 pitches, thanks. You know, and um, we got some other guys that are, that are big leaguers, and, and Michael Brooks is a big leaguer. He's a – uh, Michael Young comparison, and Dylan Cruz is a big leaguer. He's like a right-hand hitting J.D. Drew for me. Let and me stop you right there, though, real quick. So for those who are just getting into the podcast... I get excited on these kids. So the man, New Balance Future Star Series International Week is a the, series featuring the best prospects through your program Correct. split up into two teams. You have the world team yep. and you have the U.S. team. I call it the national team because I, I try to get, you know, USA. They are U.S.-born players. Pardon me. National I call, team. I call them the national team because I, I want to let USA Baseball do whatever they're doing. You know, I don't want to interfere. You do what you do. That's fine. I don't want to interfere with that. Um, so they're the national team. But it's U.S.-born players versus non-U.S.-born players. And there's 10 non-U.S.-born play, uh, team, 10 countries worth of non-U.S.-born players on this one team. You've got players from Panama, Mexico, the Dominican, the Bahamas, Puerto Rico, Canada, um, Japan, uh, missing somebody. I mean, I, I, the eight, nine, something like that. Um, Venezuela, there you go. Um, I don't think there's anybody from Cuba this year. I don't think we got there, but we got there from Canada. So we have um, we have a pretty interesting group, and it's it's diverse, and it's what it looks like on a major league field. Um, you know, some of these things you see, and they look a little um, the same. How's that? Okay. The same. And this isn't that. This is different. This is watching kids compete. This is getting, uh, you know, value in the Dominican. We're able to pull out some of the pitching that hasn't been passed. That's been passed over now. They're able to sign at 16 down there. And these guys are 93, 94 with breaking balls. And that plays. That's value at 17, right? So we have to change some lives with this event. This year is the third year of it. We're going to be in in, uh, in Boston, one game in Pawtucket, two at Fenway Park. And, and I'm... Very, oh, you're going to Pawtucket? I didn't know that. Yeah, Pawtucket, first day. You're doing McCoy Stadium? We're doing McCoy Stadium. Wow. On Saturday, 21st. Yeah. I did not know that. You know McCoy? Well, I mean, it's certainly one of the more famous minor league ballparks. Yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, that's the place where people use fishing rods mm -hmm. or broomsticks with a piece of string or rope. And that's how they get their autographs. They almost go fishing for them the over stands, the dugout. The stands are high. Yes. Yeah, they're way up there. But it's going to be fun to do that. And, of course, Fenway on Sunday is going to be great. So I got to tell you, I, I, I get excited for this. The entire organization gets excited for this. New Balance is excited for this. Uh, Marucci, one of our new sponsors, they're excited for this. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Modus, everybody's excited. And, and that's it's this one event is what we work all year for. And there's other ones underneath it. There's a national combine coming next year in a big league park. Had a conversation with a date with a team today about hosting it. So, but I get excited about seeing Dylan Cruz's and the Max Carlson's and the Mick Abel's and, um, yeah, I mean, you know, everybody, I mean, it's just really good talent. And this is why when draft time rolls around and Jeremy says, Oh, I can't believe such and such a team passed on this guy. It's because you have direct and intimate knowledge through your events on a lot of these high school kids. Of course, Grayson Rodriguez was the big one. Yeah, I just talked to him and Noah Naylor. I just talked to Grayson the other day. Orioles, first-round pick, who is throwing absolute gas. Yeah, Grayson's a good story. Bo um, Naylor, yeah. who, of course, is a uh, catcher in the Indians organization. Was available when the Astros drafted one Seth. Heineken beer. Yeah, who, um, yeah, whatever happened to that guy. And then this past year, you had, help me. Daniel Espino. Thank you. I couldn't remember. Yep. 
another pitcher, yeah. Cleveland Indians, a guy for a high school arm could move very quick. Yeah, I talked to Scott Barnsby, um, who's their scouting director. He's an advisory board member. And I talked to Scotty at, in Long Beach, and I said, hey, man, that's two. And he goes, <laughs> yeah, we just keep this train going, you know? So I, they actually drafted more guys that ended up not signing that year. But um, it's, it, man, it's, just, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and I'm, I'm excited because the advisory board clubs we work with, my peers and in some cases my mentors, have been very, very um, – you know, vocal in things they'd like to see. Um, so for me personally, this is kind of a come together for everybody. It's 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 definitely the culmination. It's it's if you will, it's my baby. It's what I work on all year. So I'm very happy to have it, and I'm looking forward to getting there. With the advisory board, how much input do you give the major league teams, or at least the guys that are on the advisory board? How much input do they have in terms of how your event is run and what the scouts there want to see, or do you just know? based on your experience having gone to these things for most of your life? Having done it with them, meaning done the job that most of them are in. I was never a scouting director, and I certainly wasn't a special assistant, but I did wear as a cross-checker with the system I was in, with Jack Sorensic um, and with Darren Johnson the Twins, multiple hats. You know, and By the time I left Seattle, I was doing stuff like you know, international and, and seeing our affiliates, and you know, my summer was full of like doing stuff on the pro side, a couple of amateur events and going to the pro side, and then – player development and seeing hitters in the off season. So that, that type of thing was making, helping make decisions on rule fives and call ups and trades. And that was really, that was a, a advanced and aggressive training for me. So I know what, what it looks like. I know what they should want. I know that we're doing things today in the industry and, and this is not calling anybody out. Jason, when I say this, but we're doing things in this industry that are more about the show than about the baseball. And ultimately yeah, it's great to have this experience, but these kids that make this event, they earn their way through it, and they're the type of kids that, man, yeah, that's great. Give me my bats. That's cool. Let me have my shoes, and that's cool. But you know what I want to do? I want to play baseball. And so you kind of take away all the fluff, and you, you peel it away, and you get back to things like cognitive training and testing that are going to help advance them. And you get back to three-game series where they have to compete. Right, you're not having to do it in a nine inning showcase, and I'm not. I get, some people do that, but that's not us. We're out watching them play, and because of that, the scouts get a lot out of it. Now, you just mentioned call ups. September first is right around the corner. Yeah, take us inside the front office into the room. What kind of decisions? What kind of? What's the criteria that a major league team uses when it comes to picking the guys who will get that major league call up on, on September 1st. The first thing that happens is they're going to assess their own situation, right? Um, if they're not in the race and they're, they're out of it, you're going to see younger guys get a lot of at bats because you want to see what happen, what's going to happen the next year. It's about off season decisions, right? If they're in the race, let's say like the Astros who are in the race perennially right now, um, they're not going to do anything to disrupt who's in the big leagues and what is, what's helping them win. What they will do is they'll, well, they'll add a piece. We'll, we'll say Kyle Tucker, just for argument's sake, because that's what everybody's talking about, right? Let's wait on that. They'll add him if he is ready to be here and can blend into the clubhouse, and it's going to just help him by being around a winning culture. Jeff Luno has said on Sports Talk 790 this morning on the Sean Salisbury show that indeed Kyle Tucker will be called up Probably on September 2nd, I think, mm -hmm. because the team is in Toronto and just dealing with all the visas and all that, it's sure. just a big mess. Well, but again, that's not so much about him helping them win. It's about him plugging into the system and being around the culture, right? He's on the roster. There's no reason not to bring him up at that point. But the at-bats he's going to get aren't going to come away from George Springer. They're not coming away from Bradley. You know, they're not going to come away from, from Reddick. The defensive innings aren't coming away from Marisnik, right? So he's going to be purely here now to be the fifth outfielder and at a time when there's nothing left for him to do in the minor leagues. He might as well come up. I disagree. I think he will take at-bats from Josh Reddick. I don't think so. I think that they want to see what he can do because Josh Reddick, until recently, has mm -hmm. struggled immensely. And I think that if he... Gets off. I think if he starts off hot, then I think you may see fewer at bats for Reddick. And I think that perhaps Kyle Tucker could be the guy in September and the postseason. If you think you being whoever, if if you're the, if you think that Josh Reddick is your guy in the in the postseason, you're not taking your bats away from him now while he's finding it. Because it's not so much about the last five months. It's in the rearview mirror. Who cares? It's about September, October, and 
Let's see, right? So if Josh Reddick is the guy, he's going to stay in the lineup. If he's still struggling and he's not figuring it out, yeah, Tucker will get an opportunity to really play. But I don't see Tucker staying in Round Rock all year and coming up here in the postseason against postseason pitching, which is where you win, pitching and defense is put in the postseason, and succeeding. I'm saying he won't do it. I'm saying he hasn't had the warm-up all year. So it's going to be a difficult task for him. If I'm A.J. Hinch, I'm sticking with the guy to help me get there right right now. Um, Tucker, to me, it's about making the playoff roster. First and foremost, it's not about taking a bats away from Reddick. So when you're making those decisions on which team, so when you're making those decisions on which guys get called up, yeah. one is your situation. As a club. As correct. a club. Correct. What are some of the other factors? Uh, you know, are you on the roster or not? Options. Um, cause you know, once you use one, you use it. So it depends if you use it all year or not. Um, need. How come times we see guys who perhaps deserve a call up, don't get a call up? Well, it depends on their situation. Some guys deserve a call up, but don't get it because they're on the roster already. And I'm talking September 1st. Yeah. They're on the roster already. So you don't need to burn it. You don't need to start the clock, right? Sometimes you don't do that. Sometimes guys that are called up are in the situation where the club's winning already and they're not needed. They need a left-handed pitcher instead of a second baseman. So they get the left-hander, right? Um, it really is unique. If you're not in contention, which, you know, is, is over half the league, right? And now sometimes like everybody but four teams now, I'm just kidding. But over half the league, then you're just going to go ahead and get kids in the big leagues and you're going to mix and match because you know who's not coming back next year already, right? It's, do I have to, what do I have to, how do I address the offseason? And then you bring everybody up that deserves it. But if you're the Astros, I don't care if you've hit 900 home runs. It's, it's about, can you help me win a World Series right now? So, you know, look, Tucker deserves to be here on what he's done in AAA. And I think that Luna leaving him down in the minor leagues would be the wrong message at September 1. What I also think, though, is that if Reddick is hot, Reddick is starting to figure it out. They're going to let him play. This guy has a ring. Tucker hasn't seen one yet, right? I'm going with that guy. Speaking of Josh Reddick, interesting article in the Houston Chronicle by Chandler Rome mentioning about how Reddick, because of his struggles, went back to his old high school coach, and the coach recommended an old-school drill that did not require a baseball bat. Uh, taping a large white towel on both ends, gripped one taped end as if it were a bat swung and tried to pop a chair with the other end. Are you familiar with this drill? Yeah, and, and it's a body feel and, and, and rhythm and, and allows you to refocus because you're not worried about hitting a baseball. You're worried about how, what the feel's like. And that's what big league hitting is largely about. It's about feel. So, um, you know, look, there's a lot of guys who are taking this approach too far with the analytics, too far hitting-wise. give you an example. Um, there was a hitting coach here the last couple of years. I, I couldn't – I'm not a fan. Just, I'm not a fan. His name's Jeff Albert. And he was the Astros hitting coach, right? Or assistant hitting coach in the big leagues with, with uh, the Cardinals now as their hitting coach. Cardinals are having one of the worst years offensively they've had in quite some time. Okay. They had an assistant hitting coach named Mark Badaska. Okay. Mark Badaska was with the Cardinals for about 10 years, with the Red Sox before that, was former big leaguer. Uh, not an analytic guy by any stretch, information guy. Pete Lawson in Mark Badaska's resume was that he was a bio. I just read this story last night. So, um, and, and I've been around both guys, you know, not Albert, not extensively observed Albert, been around him, um, been around, been around Mark for, you know, off and on over time. Um, but Mark, when he got done playing and it was in Japan, was involved in the biomechanic field. Before anybody was talking about the biomechanics and analytics, Mark Badaska was doing it. Okay. So meanwhile, He's got these hitters, and I mean all the Cardinal hitters for the last 10 years went right through him in AAA. All those guys that were that needed to get right, they went back to AAA to get right with him and went back to the big leagues, right? Well, Albert is big on lifting the ball up with an uppercut swing. That does not work with forcing velocity that explodes on you. That's how Albert tries to get to it, okay? Uh, Mark Badaska doesn't believe in that. And so when the Cardinals were struggling with Albert – they would go to Badaska and ask for help. And Buddha's trying to win, and he's trying to help that club get better. And what ended up happening was was a difference in philosophy by the Cardinals' own words, and guess who got let go? Okay? It's not always about that. Yeah, analytics is more information. It's not always about that. So um, for Reddick, and I, I'm not blaming anybody in any spot, but for Reddick to be able to simplify and go back to that, 
that's going to help help him sometimes. It's not always. It's there's such a thing called analysis by paralysis, and and his coach gave him something that connected to his body, and that's what he did. I know a pitching coach. Of course, pitchers do the towel drill. Yeah. And I asked a, a pitching coach that I know, what do you think of the towel drill? And he said, well. He goes, when you're allowed to start throwing towels in Major League Baseball, then I think it's a good thing. Until then, eh. Yeah, a towel drill, I've never been a huge fan of it as a pitcher. I understand why, because of the arm action. And, you know, you're trying to develop wrist flick and finish, but the arm action can change a little bit. From a hitting standpoint, it's, you're just letting it go. You know, it's about feeling what you're supposed to be doing. It's about focusing on an area. It depends how you, how you do it. But this particular situation is about focusing on a spot, letting your body work. So, so for me... To see him go back to something like that, it, it doesn't move me one way or the other. It just reminds us all that it's not just about launch angle. There's other stuff to it. Another big major league story was the Orioles firing, I think, 11 scouts, basically cleaning house. You're very used to seeing guys bring in their own guys when a team hires a new general manager or people in the front office. Does this seem excessive to you? Because to me, it seems like, listen, there's got to be guys in that front office or the there's got to be guys among those scouts that know what they're doing. I mean, Dean Albany is a, a guy who certainly is probably the most well-known of any of the Orioles scouts. I know he runs a college summer league team around that area. Uh, I think he's the guy that found Josh Hader. Yep. And it just seems to me that that to get rid of everybody seems a bit excessive. There's got to be someone in that group that knows what I, they're doing. Know, I, I, man, I hesitate, and I don't hesitate often, to, to address that because there's a couple of reasons, first of all, that have nothing to do with the person sitting in the chair now making that decision. The Orioles have had one of the worst teams in baseball, one of the worst systems for quite some time. This isn't new. This is, what, three or four years? They've been terrible. Is terrible okay to say? They've been bad. Okay. And it's not because they haven't had good scouts over there because Gary Race, which is a good scout, he's now with the Braves, or he was this past year. Um, they just haven't done a good job of just scouting and developing talent. And there's nothing that anybody can say because the proof is in the pudding. If you lose 100 games like, like that, that consistently, and you're constantly at the bottom of the division, what's your defense? What, what's the defense? It's, I mean, take the guy in the chair out of it for a second, right? Take the school he came from. Just, let's, just, let's not talk about that. And Lord knows I love to talk about it. Let's not talk about that for five seconds. Let's just look at their club. If Dan Duquette was still the GM in Baltimore and he fired 11 guys, would anybody say anything? Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think he would. I think people would. Well, I think because it is, it is, it's basically – most, if not all, of their scouts. Sometimes you got to clean house. And I'm not attacking one scout when I say that. Collectively, they didn't do a good job. Collectively, they didn't do a good job. And if Dan Duquette was in the chair, I'd say, well, Dan realized his staff didn't do a good job and get rid of him. I'm not emotionally tied to it. If it was me and I didn't do a good job and I got let go, I'd be like, probably could have done something better. That's just me. Maybe I'm just, that's just who I am. But I will tell you that um, 11 guys is a lot. It's a lot because usually it happens over stages in times where it's like three or four or two and the next one's five. And But Mike is trying to go in there and he said something that I, I will give him credit for because he's not hiding who he is, which is different than some of the other people he's been around in hiding who they are when it comes to what their real mission is. What Mike said is, and I'm, I'm probably going to jumble this a little bit, but it stuck out. He said, you're going to paraphrase. Well, he said, we're in a period of change in the baseball and the Orioles are also in a period of change. It's kind of what he said. Okay. He went there. He brought Sigma Dahl with him. It's a different system than what those guys have, have used. And he, he's going to invest into his type of scout that he wants to bring on board. He says he's going to replace scouts. I happen to believe him. He's gonna, but it's going to be a different type of guy. okay? And that's his ability to do it. What better time to do it if you think about it? Again, bloodbath, I get it. Not fun for anybody to feel that way. but And, and not indicting one scout because it's never a one scout deal collectively it wasn't doing a good job so if you're cleaning that out and, and mike can say this too guys mike can say this mike can say if you had this figured out you're not calling me right that's his that's his answer and i'm not a, i'm not the huge personal my i'm not a big personal fan of his i'm not when it comes to 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 the interaction he and i had had sometimes but i'm always going to be honest about what people can and can't do regardless of personal emotion and Mike Elias, phone was picked up. Hey, man, we fired our GM. This ain't working. Can you come figure this out for us? 
Guy gets the opportunity to do what he wants. So good for him for not swinging anybody along. Probably more tactful way he could have done it. Mike's 36 years old. And I don't know if there is a good way to do it. Well, you could have done it two or three at a time. That's what you could have done. Mike okay. said, I'm going to wipe everybody out. Here's where the problem is going to come into play. And this has nothing to do with Mike Elias either. Okay? So word on the street. Remember I called you in, I don't know, earlier this month? Okay. And I, said, I said, word on the street is the Houston Astros are looking to hire scouts again. Word on the street from other clubs is, is anybody paying attention to, I mean, we're all paying it. We see it. It went too far. It didn't work. Say that I, what, again. Hold on a minute. Say that again. Which part? Because I love Just saying start from all the beginning. Okay. So word on the street this year, this summer, was that the Astros were looking to hire scouts. Let's let that sink in for a minute. Because you've got a club who has gone out of their way to destroy scouts. I'll say it because I can. They have their own methods and traditional scouting isn't part of it. And they've gone out of their way to clean out really good scouts who helped them win a World Series. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to I'm going to get into this for half a second because it's probably been a couple of years and some of the recent interaction on Astros Twitter had got me thinking a little bit about it, you know, just about it. And while I am certainly not old school and I'm certainly into any information I can get to help the evaluation and development process, as long as it's, you know, the right, you have the right to take it and throw it away and anything else and use it. Um, I'm just not going to lie to myself that these guys were brand new with advanced information. Maybe it was a type pitch data. They're good there. They're probably one of the first ones at the table there, but that advantage is gone too. Okay. There are other, all the other clubs are doing it. So how do you differentiate yourself now? Well, guess what? You've been spending seven, eight years now telling the industry, you don't like traditional scouts because you've got a point to prove. So all these guys that help you win a World Series, you decide they don't have any value for you. You're going to take the information they can give you, and they can't help you anymore. Meanwhile, these same guys are what makes the game go. Now, it's about the players. It's always about the players. And I'm pro player, man, and the best job in the world is the one in the big leagues, and there's no question about it. But I'll tell you this. Those guys don't get to get there. They don't get there unless somebody else is making the decision. And who gets to go in the door? Scouts have something to do with that. They have a lot to do with that. And so now you've told an industry, we don't need you. We don't like you. We don't see any value in you. Uh-oh, our system is empty. Uh-oh, we've traded our top guys away, except for one or two. Now what? We got two more years before this massive reboot really kicks in. And these guys are smart enough to know that. They're smart guys. They know that much. So what do they do? Hey, uh, yeah, I need an area guy. I need a scout to do this. Scout to do this. and and people and people are just sitting back like this because now oh now you how you like me now now you need me now you want us that's the attitude they're going to get so that happened in Houston. Mike Elias was part of that in Houston. He's he's Luno's. Um, how do I say this? I'm gonna call him his boy. He was right hand man. Yeah yeah that's a good idea. Right hand man. Now he's got his own ship in Baltimore. Now I I, I will say that Mike does not share the same depth of views that Jeff does. Mike doesn't share that. Mike actually had to go out in the field and do the job. Jeff was a scout director, but mm -hmm. Mike had to go out and do the actual job from an area scout to a cross checker to working in the complex. The guy hit every step along the way in baseball operations, accelerated as it was, good, bad, or otherwise, he actually had to do it. He actually had to do it. So he's got a different respect for it. So he's going to go to Baltimore, and while it isn't pretty – he probably has to deal with some of the perception. Hey, you're just like Luno. I'm going to come over there for a year, and you're going to fire me too. I don't think it's going to be that way, but that's what's going to have to happen. So Mike's going to have to battle a ghost that he didn't create. Because he didn't create it. I'm sorry. That one for me, I will say this, because I'm certainly not bitter. I love where I'm at right now. I'm very happy in my life. Um, I got some really good friends in this industry who have, who have continued to mentor my growth along the way, and some of these conversations I'm having about going back, although I haven't taken them, are fun to have because it means that my peers see value in what I can bring to the table. It's personally gratifying. It doesn't mean I'm going to do it yet, okay? But it, it does mean, it does mean that those guys who sell out every day, whose families take a beating and sacrifice and, and, and give everything they can so that these guys can go make a game great, it means they deserve a little more respect.
And if Astros Twitter and there's a couple of you who I'm specifically talking to don't think those scouts deserve respect because you couldn't walk in their shoes because you're the guy who felt picked on somewhere and you got an ax to grind, take a step back, man, because the game doesn't need you and it doesn't need us and it doesn't need anybody. What it does need is it needs a collection of opinions and backgrounds and experiences to be great. And that's what this is. And those scouts have all that run around in their head. Now I'm done. And because you're done, I think we should be done. How's that? Because I think we need to vacate the studio. I have one more thing to talk about. That's okay. Yeah, what's that? So there was a tragedy in baseball mm. the other day. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. And for all of us who've ever been away from our families, for all of us who have ever felt the, our kids and missed being around them, and for all of us who have ever, um, in, in some ways, put the game first, it, it, it's, it's, it, you can't help but take a step back. And so Blake Bivens... Um, you know, lost his wife and his son and his mother-in-law. I can't imagine what that's like. I think the entire baseball world feels it. They know exactly what you're feeling in, in, in from a standpoint of you weren't there. And that's got to weigh on you. But understand, it, you know, I know we, I don't know you and you don't know me. And, and if you hear this, remember this. You're working. And you were right where she wanted you to be. And you were trying to do everything you could for your son. And while it doesn't make it easier... Um, there's a world of support out there for you and, and, and to try to remember who, that, who they were and what that meant for you to be able to chase your dream. And I know that you appreciate that. We all know you appreciate that. And from the bottom of all of our hearts, collectively, you know, we're with you. And it's unfortunate that because of a video of a naked man running around, people in some ways are making light of the situation, not making light of it, but it, it takes on a different perspective because the video is clearly of someone who was mentally disturbed running around naked and it's getting shared and shared and shared but really again three people lost their lives including a young mother and a little boy and now a baseball player has to pick up the pieces and move on much like any other victim of of a of a violent crime like this one i spent I don't know, probably 5,000 nights, and it's not an exaggeration, in 22 years um, on the road. And, uh, you know, you're chasing your dream and you're part of something you love. And even on this side where I'm no longer working directly for a club, and I get out and I'm gone doing the series and I bounce in and out and I get to go. I mean, it's a great life, but um, if you don't feel the sense of, hey, what if it was my family? You know, if you don't feel the sense of all the life you've missed – somewhere everybody in baseball feels it right now whether it's not us and we, and we and we're thankful that our families weren't affected and you you appreciate things a little more for a day but the key here is going to be supporting somebody as a community who can never get that back because he's going to blame himself he's going to blame if i had been there i could have stopped it i'm here playing a baseball and i lost my wife and i can't get that back and she you were there where she wanted you to be but you can't you can't help but feel for him and you can't help but think about your own life and um you know part of that i guess is why i came in here a little fired up over the scouting side of it because you know you got to remember man tomorrow's promise to nobody and the game doesn't care the game shouldn't care it's the greatest game in the world for me and it shouldn't care so um you know I'm, i'm i'm i feel feel for you we all feel for you and uh you know the community's there And that's another episode of Extra Bases with Bristol and Booth.